Church. Here. Chris Anson. Here. Shane Fisher. We have a quorum. A consideration and action of a consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Roll call. John Kramer. Yes. Tim Poplin. Yes. Dee Dee Patterson. Yes. Bill Wantland. Yes. Gary Houck. Yes. Larry Church. Yes. Chris Anson. Yes. Motion passes. Are there any appearances or petitions from the audience? Not there being no further business. A motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. That brings us to the Seminole Utilities Authority. Um, call to order. Roll call, Jay. Dee Dee Patterson. Here. John Kramer. Here. Chris Anson. Here. Bill Watland. Here. Jeff Griffin. Tim Poplin. Here. Gary Houck. Here. Larry Church. Here. Shane Fisher. We have a quorum. Consideration and action of consent agenda. All in favor? Move to approve. Second. Roll call. Dee Dee Patterson? Yes. John Kramer? Yes. Chris Anson? Yes. Bill Wantland? Yes. Tim Poplin? Yes. Gary Houck? Yes. Larry Church? Yes. Motion, motion passes. Are there any appearances or petitions from the audience? Not there being no further business, a motion to adjourn is in order. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That brings us then to the Seminole City Council. A call to order. Roll call, Jay. Chris Anson? Yes. Dee Dee Patterson? Here. Gary Houck? Here. Larry Church? Here. Tim Poplin? Here. Bill Watland? Here. John Kramer? Here. Jeff Griffin? Shane Fisher. We have a quorum. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Follow by the prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, I miss you and miss you. Hange ki yu dai. Pumagasapke de kwichi de medo moment. Potalofa seminole moment posti mulligan. It is no kid you could is, moment you may have sacked a misc. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayer of thanks for the city of Seminole and all our people. Let us love one another, for you, God, are love. Amen. 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 <coughs> Are there any uh, petitions or appearances from the audience for the City Council? If not, we then move on to approvals and acceptances. Number one, bids, consideration and possible action to approve the low bid of $601,171 from a key excavating for utility relocation on the US 270 Magnolia Creek Bridge project. This is our big expansion uh, four laning to we woke a project and uh, this is just the approval process to relocate the utilities. Uh, we've been assured that uh, we're going to be held whole on this. So I think we're in good shape to go ahead and execute and ready to go on the project. So as the money to begin with, where exactly is it coming from? I mean, we have to prepay on this. It'll be coming out of your reserve waiting reserve. on reimbursement. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Chris Anson? Yes. Dee Dee Patterson? Yes. Gary Howe? Yes. Larry Church? Yes. Tim Poplin? Yes. Bill Wantland? Yes. John Kramer? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, we move to current business number two, discussion to consider engineering for a storm water project north of Highway 9 and 99. We have with us, uh, you may remember Janet Meshack. She has the Meshack Engineering Firm, the foremost uh, flood engineer in Oklahoma. She's done uh, too many projects to list, but uh, she's extremely well respected. And uh, you will recall that we went through a, uh, an extensive planning process and uh, kind of had a, a great feel for where we needed to go. We just didn't have any idea how we were going to pay for it. Uh, recently, uh, some developments have, have come through. And uh, I'll let her, I won't steal her thunder, but it looks like there are funds available 
uh, or at least substantially available that if we get our our planning and, and our application in because of the the planning that is already in place it kind of moves us ahead of a lot of others that may be trying to panic plan uh, and uh, we're we're kind of at the front of the line if we want to be and so we wanted to bring this to you and and have a, a discussion I'll hand out the hard copies uh, I just brought hard copies of the slides so you'd have um, all of the numbers for later the what you're looking at up here is the area yes, north it across this location I'll show you a closer uh, schematic of it but this this would be what the flooded area would look like and it would tail out at about the bridges on both sides of the section um, then I also uh, I have another slide where we redid the floodplain did all of the hydrology and hydraulics to do this this is what our existing floodplain looks like uh, all the cross sections are still on, just ignore those. But so you can see that there, some of this is, or a big part of it is floodplain anyway. But what we would have to do is get uh, some sort of legal right to flood those properties, probably an easement, um, in order to be able to do this. Now let me just show you this. This is a close up down at the intersection of Met Phillips and Highland Line and uh, Wrangler. And uh, there's a property line, I don't, you can't really see these purple lines very well, but to miss that and not have to interfere with these properties and to kind of stay away from this lift station, we would construct what's essentially a dam that would curl back up around here and it would tie in at this end and tie in at this end. We would have to build a fairly expensive overflow structure because we don't really have the room at this end to construct, you know, you typically want to put a spillway in undisturbed soil, you know, so that you didn't worry about washing it out. But we don't really have that luxury, so we're looking at building a, a concrete spillway here, and there'll be a pipe through the dam, and then we'll set the elevation of the spillway so that it won't overtop until we, you know, we have a hundred year storm collected behind it. So it's a, it's a long dam, but, um, it's kind of in virgin territory then we may I don't know Mike how you feel about this but maybe this roadway out to the lift station we could incorporate you know an access up to the to the dam itself so that it can be maintained etc so it would be in a, a pretty good spot for that so if we construct this then this is downstream with highway 9 at the top and Mitt Phillips kind of right there in the middle the the lime green sort of hope you're not hung over color there <laughs> is uh, is the existing floodplain the way it is now and it reduces to what's just in the blue and in doing that you can see some of these buildings out here actually come out of the floodplain and and, and, mo and all the other buildings have a lowered flood depth so the the program we're looking at applying for is called the hazard mitigation grant program and it's um, it is uh, when when a federally declared disaster occurs, the federal government sets aside 20% of the uninsured loss in order to. It's on already. Okay. Hello. Is that better? Uh, they set aside 20% of the uninsured losses from this, and since not a lot of people have flood insurance, there's typically a lot of uninsured losses. Well, there's two. Um, there been a change at the state in the hazard mitigation officer, and so there were some things that kind of lagged further than they thought. So there are two funding packages, one that has maybe about $3 million in it that you would have to get a complete application in by March, but the one that we would probably apply for here would be one that's due at the end of March that has more than $6 million. And, um, 
and this, the federal cost, of, of the federal share of the cost of this, it's a 75-25% split, would be somewhere in the four, four to four and a half million dollar range. So that would be one we could do, but we need to prepare uh, probably 30% plans in order to convince the government that we, you know, we have a good uh, cost estimate and that, you know, they have time to uh, evaluate the hydraulics and make sure that we're telling the truth when we show that we have a benefit cost ratio. That in, this, in this case, if we just build the dam and do this, we will have uh, about six and a half million dollars in um, in benefits, avoided flood damages. So that's what you have to have. You have to have a larger number than that than what the project costs. So um, here we had looked at. You can kind of see this area right down here. That's a construction. That causes the water to back up in here, and we looked at adding a piece of this to open it up because if we're providing detention upstream, then we're going to be able to allow some extra water to go through there, but it didn't, the cost of it is about the same as the reduction in damages, so it really doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. We can still get a project with yeah, and we'd have about seven million dollars in damage reduction for this one if we did that, as opposed to six and a half without building that uh, probably seven hundred thousand dollar excavation through there. And uh, we avoid a 404 permit and some other things that really slow down a project. So it probably makes more sense. You can see that there's not a lot of difference. The blue outline here is the floodplain without this opened up where it you know it only decreases a little bit and just down in this area so we we feel like we still have a really good project even if we don't do that part of the project so is everybody familiar with what that little bottleneck was it, it's it's north of struthers and yeah it's right behind where the the little tobacco shop was. I think this is, is this the armory here and the baseball fields start down here. And this is where there's a little uh, fireworks stand, mm -hmm. little kind of fenced yeah. off area there. It would be back behind that if we were to do it. But it does add on a, a little more expense than, uh, or I mean, it, it the, the benefit is it just kind of washes out when we do that. So. Uh, we do get a little more reduction, and we can look at that later, I suppose, but if we just do the dam... Washes out. Is that a flood uh, technical no, term? No, or it's, is a that flood, it's a money flood term. <laughs> okay. The benefits okay. don't really outweigh the, I see. the cost. Okay. They're just kind of even. So we looked at it both ways. We've kind of done a very conceptual cost estimate of the, of the, um, the project. The left two columns are looking at what the, the dam would cost, what the downstream excavation would cost, and then the grant uh, preparation and administration as well as the engineering. And since we don't really know what the utilities are, uh, we have just included kind of that master drainage planning level of a 25% utility relocation budget because in a lot of projects it's that high. Then we took it completely out of the second column. So what we're looking at is a difference. The, the actual cost would be someplace between that 5.3 million versus the 6.4. But if we move over to the other two columns and we take out the downstream excavation completely and just build the dam, we're looking at costs that are lower by six to eight hundred thousand dollars and everything reduces. The engineering we've estimated at 6%, so it reduces in all of those cases. And the actual project would end up costing between 5.6 million and 4.7 million, depending on how much of a utility relocation we have in that location. So I've just highlighted those. We still have 6.5 million in avoided flood benefits, so this would qualify for this hazard mitigation grant. And um, 
The, the reason we're looking at this now is we have to submit an NOI. The city needs to submit that that says... Notice of intent. Not, thank you. Notice of intent that would um, say we need, we need a project that's about $5.665 million if we use the larger value of that. The local match is $1.4 million, and the federal share in that case would be $4.2 million. Again, they have about six and a half. If we act quickly, we can get it. So, um, so after the after they accept it and they contact the city and say, okay, open up the application, you do an e-grant application for this, then we would have to prepare those thirty percent plans to really pin down that cost and take a look at actually what utility relocations are, and then. Um, and then uh, we can, at the application phase, when we would submit that probably in the end of April or so, then as long as that number is less, you know, equal to or less than what we submitted on our NOI, we're okay. We just want to make sure we have enough money in it to begin with because you can't really go back and ask for more because they set aside this money for each of them. So that's that's kind of our our goal. But this this would allow the city to go ahead and we've already talked to the state hazard mitigation officer about this to determine the funding levels. And so do you want to go ahead and talk about potential funding sources? I don't want to break your stride. You're you're covering a lot of territory okay. that well I I generally blow by it a little faster maybe than I should. But we've talked in the past about trying to develop a stormwater utility fee for the city of Seminole, which would be, it's since stormwater is accepted as a, a utility like water and sewer and everything else, since the city has to take care of the storm sewer or stormwater system in the city, then uh, the city has about 2,400 residential meters. I'm sure it changes daily. And they have about 600 non-residential meters so that's about the number of customers we think we would have and so how this is determined is that a typical residential lot has about somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 square feet of impervious area so all of the residential users would pay based on kind of that average impervious area on their site but the commercial users those that impervious area would actually be measured you divide it by whatever number your your equivalent service unit is determined to be, and we we typically use 2650 because the city of Tulsa developed it a long time ago, and and it always turns out to be pretty close to that. So typically, the average size of and uh, or the yeah the average size of impervious area for commercial users is around. 10 of those equivalent service units. So that would be 10 times 600 would give us an extra 6,000 uh, equivalent service units compared to the, the 2,400 we get from the residences, meaning we'd have a total of 8,400 equivalent service units we could collect on. And the fees are, what we just kind of did a monthly and an annual fee to, to sort of get a range of um, uh, uh, dollar amounts that you could be expected to get. This could be used for debt service. It just, you know, once this is established, if the city elects to go ahead with this, then you write an ordinance and you describe what the money goes towards. Everyone's treated the same, just like you are on a water bill. You don't exempt people because um, then you run into a uh, a case where you might it might be considered an arbitrary tax that people didn't vote on. If it's just treated as a utility, which is the way it is across the nation, then then that will fly legally and can provide that um, you know additional money. And if we weren't using it for this, then there'd be other things, maybe for maintenance of the storm sewer stormwater system, uh, buying a back truck every now and then to clean out storm sewers. You know, just develop an actual schedule of things, maybe hire a crew or something to be able to work on it. Okay, can you can you back up just a second? Just seeing what each of these utility fees would raise, if you could back up now and, 
and show us how much match money you project that we would need. Sure. I think the local match is going to be someplace between a million two and a million four, something like that, that the city has to come up with. Um, since this, these costs include a, a stab at what the right of way would cost to do this, or easement costs for a flooding property upstream, <coughs> um, if those if those were donated, it's still a part of the project cost, and that could be part of the local share. So there's um, depending on how, how close we are to right on what those costs are, that that would be a significant portion of it. But we'd still have, I, I'd say, a minimum of half of that 1.4 that the city would have to be able to come up with. Okay. Uh, to put it in perspective, a, a million dollars over 10 years is roughly is going to cost you about 10000 a month, so $120,000 a year. If you look at our income projection, uh, so a dollar fee would bring in right at a little less than a million dollars worth of debt service. So you're really, if you're looking at just doing it this way, the utility fee, you would be looking at probably a dollar seventy per user, or, or stratified among, like she said, the residential and non-residential. You can adjust that to the impervious sur uh, surface yeah, calculation. You assume all of the residences have the same right. amount of impervious area, even though actually they don't, but it just makes it a much easier calculation. But commercial, you actually measure the, or non-residential, you actually measure the impervious area. And the, I, I asked, we do a lot of stormwater utility fees, and so the time it would take to digitize those areas, um, since we don't have planimetric, mm -hmm. planimetrics in the city, uh, plus the time to develop the fee and reconcile all the water accounts and, and all of that. Uh, we just said about fifty-two thousand dollars. So, you know, you would. I I, I would not recommend anything lower than a three-dollar fee. We just put the dollar up there because at one time there was Hawk City used to have a one-dollar fee. It took forever to collect any money. There, theirs is now up to two seventy-five at least. But the three-dollar. In fact, I I have um, these are just some samples of other areas. Oklahoma City actually uses a water meter, you know, so if, uh, if you have a water meter for the commercial areas, then you pay a certain amount, and all the residences, residences, of course, would pay the same amount, but if you have a big water meter, you pay a bigger fee, and it's not really a fair way to do it, because, you know, if you own a big parking lot, and you don't even use water, you don't pay a fee, so... We, you know, the, the better way to do this is to actually use impervious areas. I think there was one other, Jenks, I think, just charges $2 per water fee, water meter. Uh, they're the other ones out there. Enid has a $4.38 fee with their non-residential uh, minimum set at $21.91. Um, Ponca City actually now does $2.75 residential. <coughs> But they just charge five dollars and seventy-five cents for their, for their not. I mean, yeah, they're non-residential. Yeah. And <clears throat> you can see that seventy-five percent of the fees come from the non-residential users because they produce so much runoff. So, so it's not uh, it's not very effective unless you do it by impervious area. Um, Chickasha just passed one for seven dollars. Is our match up front? Uh, that we make for this, or is it's it over the three year period? Three year. Um, it, you know. More than likely, Tim, we'd go borrow the money uh, before they. There's a lot of environmental clearance issues and things that you've got to go through along the way, and before they actually give you a release of funds, they're going to want a commitment that you've got a, a way to get that money in the bank. We'll probably go borrow that money. Uh, now, before we go too much further, I, I'd like to tell you that I think there's a way to marry these or an alternative to uh, just putting it on water meters or storm utility fee. I think uh, there's a way to create a business improvement district 
where those those businesses that are so affected down through from basically Carl's Jr. all the way up to uh, movie gallery um, and even some of the residential area behind uh, our fam or Dollar General, uh, I think you can create a business improvement district and assess them a fee. Uh, so it, that would be substantially more than what she's talking about because it, it impacts them more. I, I get a good feeling from the people that own those businesses that if they could get a solution like this, they'd be more than happy uh, to pay what whatever it takes to get this thing through. So I think there's a combination of ways that, that you could work it. What we were hoping to get from you tonight is, uh, yeah, we're not interested, or hey, if we can get 75% grant money to do a project that large, yeah, we, we, we want to investigate some more. Um, more than uh, Janet has sent us, she mentioned a while ago, she did speed through this part, which was the 30% engineering. Uh, yeah, that's that's a part of the that would be phase in the the phase one engineering and grant preparation uh, would be uh, to develop you know to survey everything and develop put put together good enough plans that we can develop a believable cost estimate for this and then thirty percent is kind of an industry standard for a conceptual level set of plans. So that's what that is. The phase two would be to go ahead and put together all the contract documents and to also administer the grant. That's a cost that, uh, I mean, it assumes a certain amount of money per month, you know, to do all the paperwork. And 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 there's a lot of, uh, in, in the grant preparation, we have to get, we have to get uh, historic archeological clearance. We have to do, uh, you, there's just a lot of government paperwork, you know, that you you have to go through to do that. Plus, what so to get us to the point before we know if we can get the grant, you're saying that we need that 30% engineering finished. I don't finished. think that they would do that based on. I've never seen them do it based on the master drainage planning level oh, yeah. estimate. Yeah, I agree. They they have to have some assurance that this is that the costs we're showing are outdone by the benefits that it receives, which we think that it is. And I think our costs are yeah. conservative on this. Is everybody, that last, that last line item, that avoided flood damage, that's really what's motivating them to give us the grant to solve the problem. I don't... Right, if we were, if we had minimal utilities to relocate, they'd be looking at Three and a half million dollar cost federal share, a 4.7 million. It's a better than one to one ratio, um, so it's a good expenditure of federal dollars. And the state wants to. Uh, the Oklahoma Emergency Management is the grant sub grantee. For the grantee, if they're the grantee, we would be the sub grantee. I forget how that works, but yeah. um, but they're interested in doing this from for the longest time. They were just spending this money on safe rooms and. They now have about 850,000 safe room grants out there, and the, the SHPO told me that if you send another one off to the lady that takes care of those, she'd probably kill it. So, yeah. so, so he's excited walk, about one big project here. Yeah, walk me back through. If we look at the uh, engineering section, the phase <coughs> one engineering and the grant preparation, mm -hmm. so uh, the city council would be okaying roughly $118,000 is that relatively right, accurate that, to get that, us right. through the grant application? The phase two engineering, when would that happen? As soon as they uh, approve the application, then they would let you know you're going to get the grant. So that, that would begin at okay. that point. Okay. So you wouldn't be spending that money without assurance that they would okay. give you the grant. Is there potential that the flood, the money that we've already spent on the flood planning grant, or the, excuse me, the flood plan, and the the combination of both those engineering grant preparation would be counted as match as part of the match. Well, that's one of the things that Matt Rollins is a state hazard mitigation officer, and he that was something he pointed out that since you all have already spent 
you know, $100,000 on that, that's, we would need to add it to this cost because it just, you know, it would become part of that project. But uh, I can confirm that with him because he was still going to check on that with the feds, but it did lead directly to a project. So that's kind of, um, it, it, should, yeah. it should follow the requirements. We'll see. Okay, good. Well, there are opportunities for that. You know, if, if uh, someone donated the dirt we needed to build the dam, then we would have to get a cost of that. Um, I think right after, if, if the NOI is accepted and they go ahead with this, which I think there's an excellent chance of, we would probably want to get an appraisal anyway of the, the lands we're looking at and, and then um, we could talk to the appraiser about the value. It would probably be better to come um, from the contractor, from a contractor. But that's that's something they've done in the past. Is is if we're donating materials, then the contractor just has labor involved. So um, then, if somebody donates right away, that's another in kind value that we can get. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we talked about. I have them all the time. So. I know, and so yeah, you, should, you forget them all because there's so many of them. I know. That's, I'm that way too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we do we do have that opportunity. It's a big expenditure of money. I think it make a big difference in the flooding. And even though there still appears to be a, a large floodplain, it's, it's a much shallower one and hopefully will be out of most of the buildings. And the, the ones that have flooded recently are one ones the, that it would help. As a lay person, I have a lot of uh, concepts about flood water. And seeing Josh and Lacey here, I, I, it, it occurs to me that if we hold the flood water back from we woke a creek, and that's really what we're talking about doing, both Magnolia and it ultimately that we woke a tributary, does that give the ability for the other areas to evacuate faster yes. and right. will improve them as well? Well, it, it depends. The stormwater detention is is um, most productive when it's in an, the upstream part of the watershed. And it holds back water so the lower areas can come in and get out faster. So it, you know, it's, it stops the kind of coincident flooding that occurs mm -hmm. when you have downstream tributaries. Now if you're in the lower part of the watershed, you may want to actually look at channelization, which would get that lower water out before that comes. That's why you have to do a model of the entire watershed and just kind of see how the timing works out for that. Yeah, I'll stay with my lay person understanding. <laughs> uh, lower water means further down the creek? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, for down, further downstream. Okay. I'll say lower when I'm talking down. Jim, on a 100-year flood on the, on the pond, how many acres was that? The, well, if you... 170? Yeah, it was like 172 that, that, that yellow area, I believe it was like... Yes, there'll be a pipe through the dam. We may, since this is a lot of water and it would take a long time to drain, we may build sort of a tower structure that has an opening at a higher elevation and that with a sluice gate maybe, so that we could wait till the flood, you know, till it went down downstream and then release water more quickly. There's a couple of different opportunities uh, for that. We may look at building a kind of a wet pond on the upstream end so that we could turn a pipe down and then not have the, all the debris get to it. You know, it would actually take, because its water would still build up and push it out. But, you know, there's a, a, number, a number of ways of, of doing that. Um, but the, the spillway has to be there because this is a big enough area that this would be considered a high hazard dam. 
by the Water Resources Board because of the downstream structures that are there. So we have to, it has to pass 50% of the probable maximum flood um, with a foot of free water, I believe is what we ended up designing it. So a, a probable maximum flood is something like 30 inches in a day, you know, so maybe 15 inches in a day we go over the spillway and then have, still have a foot before it gets to the top of the dam. It's a big one. This does not affect the water coming off of 9 east of 377? No. When we have heavy rains, we have a, a large amount of water that comes down there too. Do we not, Steve? My east of 377 you're talking yeah, about yeah it comes Just down in twin lakes immediately east there's kind of there's a culvert there well it's uh, almost out to walmart it comes off the hill yeah uh well i don't, on highway nine i don't i think we determined that that's not such a huge deal it's actually yeah, i know it just does not affect it but when we have heavy rain it floods that area pretty good. Floods the homes, you mean? Yes. Yeah, that's a different deal entirely, Is right? That on Chris? That's Chris? on. Uh, Chris, so. Is that the Is are, you, are you talking about on Grisso or in Northwood? I mean, uh, uh, Eastgate. Poor well, me. The, the water from Eastgate comes down <clears throat> to, I mean, it eventually gets down to Grisso. So, yeah. Um, and this, what this is going to do is there's areas along Grisso backwater from Magnolia Creek and so that will be lowered and water will That's be right. able to get out. We did take a look at putting in stormwater detention up there as well but it didn't have as high a benefit cost ratio and it added on a whole lot more expense so um, I mean it could be maybe done at a later time but the, a lot of that along Grissel is just that water you know coming backing up, up. Well, and, I, or coming down the hill, you know, and making its way through those houses, too, coming, you know, to, from the east. So there's a couple of, couple of things to consider there. But in any case, we would do this anyway. This is kind of the base of all of the alternatives, is building, is providing this stormwater ditch at this location. We're trying to call this a stormwater detention facility because the federal government doesn't like to build dams using hazard mitigation grants. They, there are supposedly other funding packages for that. They're not nearly as good as the hazard mitigation mm -hmm. grant program. And the state hazard mitigation officer really feels like this will be a good project for them. So What's those like little control. yellow lines that come up across well, Those are cross-sections and I I actually took these off of the web viewer that we created for Seminole, and I we have kind of a, a global uh, layer shape file that's in there that it contains the you know the cross section and the floodplain and the floodway where it exists, and I couldn't turn those off individually. So all that is is part of the way that we model the watershed. So you can see the cross sections that we take and determine how large it is. This fits all that water also behind CJ tank trucks, that big section that comes through there, it also catch that. Again, my theory is that if we can, <coughs> Mike and I both have observed that our, our real flooding problems happen when we woke a creek gets full. It just starts pushing back, and especially on that grisso flooding, once Magnolia Creek is full, it's got nowhere to go except those homes. It's not necessarily that first rush of water coming off the hill that is the problem. It's when Magnolia Creek begins to back up and that water has no exit. And you can see that area down just north of Strothers that's, uh, that's restricted through there too. That, that helps cause that, which is one of the reasons we thought about doing that excavation through there. That's something that could still be done at any time, but you you still have to recognize that once it gets to Strathers, the it's still pretty restricted there. It's not, but this is just very restricted back in that area, so. 
What say you? You want me to continue to develop ideas on, or not so much? Well, I move that you continue to develop the ideas. We've got to do something to help those people up there on the, mm -hmm. that flood all the time. I mean, that's the responsibility of the city. So we need to, we need, and it, you know, that always sounds like a good idea back up there building a retention pond and letting that water drain off slowly. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, Jay. Chris Anson? Yes. D.D. Patterson? Yes. Jerry Howe? Yes. Larry Church? Yes. Tim Poplin? Yes. Bill Wantland? Yes. John Kramer? Yes. Motion passes. Yes. There's not really a, uh, we're not obligated at that point. Mm. You know, we did not submit the application that the city chose to. What I, what I plan on doing uh, in the near future, well, let's go ahead and send in the NOI, okay. and uh, we'll almost immediately, uh, boy, we're in a tough time right now up against the holidays, but uh, we'll, we'll probably get a special meeting here. And in the meantime, uh, I'm going to be squeezing Jay to find me $118,000. So that if you guys choose to go ahead and, and let's go with the application, we'll have it. Uh, we'll have to go out for proposals for that. Yep. That's just what we estimate. That's the right. Cost. So the next meeting will likely okay a proposal. You'll, in effect, be obligating, uh, appropriating is probably the best term, uh, the 118000 to go go try to get us three point some million dollars for flood retention area. And I'll be talking at length with the Tates and, uh, and other folks that are going to be impacted by this. If I turn this off, will the fan continue to run? Uh, yeah, you're fine. Yep, one more time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Moving on then to item three, under current business, consideration and possible action regarding the transfer and conveyance of Northwood Park to Seminole Public Schools, subject to continued access by the public as recommended by the Park Board. Yeah, we've been, uh, we've been in discussions with our, our local school superintendent, Mr. Gaches, and uh, I, I think we, we put it in front of the Park Board there in favor of of it uh, what I would like to do we went ahead and agended it before I actually got clearance from the land water conservation fund the LWCF put a lot of money into this uh, what I'd like to do and I apologize but I'd like to table this for maybe until we have that special meeting and let me get real clearance from them before we start conveying property they've got yeah. uh, an interest in is there a motion to table? So sure move. Second. Roll call. Chris Anson? Yes. Dee Dee Patterson? Yes. Gary Houck? Yes. Larry Church? Yes. Tim Hoffman? Yes. Bill Wadlin? Yes. John Kramer? Yes. Motion to table passes. All right, that brings us into reports. Uh, the mayor is not here, so we move to the city manager. Uh, Hopefully everyone's got to experience our new stop signs. Uh, we've got uh, Don Pinkerton Corner, who he's been requesting those uh, stop signs up by the Die Body Shop. Uh, I've had a couple of cussings over it so far, but so far there's been no traffic accidents or anything of that nature. So uh, it's going to take a little bit of getting used to. The park board, I think, uh, certainly had the, the best interest of the children at heart. Uh, you've, if you've driven through there, you've seen the speed bumps and the things that are in place now. Um, so that's going to take a little bit of getting used to, but in, in the end, I think our children are going to be much safer. Uh, we did get a, a, I can't believe Bryant Baker didn't bring us uh, his new rescue boat. 
there's no better time to get prepared for flooding than, uh, than when you're in a drought. So we do, and we've been granted the, uh, the new rescue boat. They've got uh, several trainings that they need to go through, but uh, once they are certified, they'll be certified in this region for rescue. So uh, if anybody gets in, in floodwaters, we're going to be ready to respond. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but we finally got uh, on, the, on the list and got our boat. And we're, we're excited. I think the guys are really excited. Uh, I told them I wanted training to start next week when it hits about 13 degrees. They didn't <laughs> seem to agree with that. Uh, I just want to give uh, kudos to Snowman Wonderland, the work that the Lions Club has done. Uh, Ernie uh, Willis and Neil Craig, they, I don't <laughs> I'm pretty certain they're spending a lot more hours doing this than they do on their other jobs. So uh, our, our guys, uh, our public works people and our parks guys have, have really done way, way beyond the call of duty on this. Uh, after losing the inmates and the labor hours that we lost in that deal, we, we weren't sure we were going to be able to pull this off. But uh, our guys, once again, show us what they're made of, and they come through when we don't expect uh, that. And they, they really do a fantastic job. We're really pleased to have them. Uh, if you've ever seen that commercial where the, the, the lady has the earbud in as she's getting married listening to a ball game, Brad and I have been a little distracted. Our daughters are playing basketball in Chandler tonight, so he's flashing me scores, and I'm kind of okay. So uh, I apologize for that, but no, that's all I have. City attorney. We're losing right now. Ah. <laughs> that's all I've got. That's not very good. <laughs> okay, remarks and inquiries of council members, Ward 1. Uh, I really have nothing to add at this point that hasn't already been said for all that we do in this city and all that the city does for us and our thanks in that regard. Larry? I have very little to add also. I've gotten positive response from the speed bumps and the stop signs. Good. I, I really have. I haven't heard anyone complaining about Good. that. Everyone has said that they're glad that that's happened and uh, are pleased with it. So. I, I just add one thing. I have had one complaint about the height of the speed bumps. That they may be too high. <laughs> <laughs> they're working. They're working. Work. Ward 2, Gary. I'd just like to thank the public, the staff. I mean... Without you, we would not have the softball quad or the wellness center. I mean, it takes everybody to do it. Thank you very much. That's right. John Kramer. I have nothing. Ward 3, uh, Tim Poplin. I enjoyed reading the articles in the paper this last week. We kind of went to bat for ourselves. Uh, the public went to bat for us, and I appreciate that. Um, we're all up here for the right reasons, and uh, some people don't realize that, but uh, I wouldn't be here if we weren't here for the right reasons, and uh, I think we're kind of all on that same page, but uh, everybody enjoy the Christmas season, and that's about all I got. Ward 4, Chris Anson. Well, the, the speed bumps, uh, the, one I, the one feedback I got was from a, a teenage driver, and he and his buddy were... I guess over here somewhere, the wellness center somewhere, and they were uh, trying to see who could get to my house the fastest. And the one that lost told me it was our fault for putting the speed bumps in. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I was like, good. <laughs> yeah. Did he batters? I'd like to thank the staff. We're very blessed to have the people that we have working for the city. They do a wonderful job. We appreciate them. Appreciate you, Steve. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And then next on our agenda is executive session. So if there is a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. We'll take a five-minute break and get ready for executive session. Uh, hi, I'm David Kirk. <coughs> I'm He's a co-op. Oh, yeah. They work. Oh, yeah. They do. Yeah. Yeah.